thing happens in chapter 12. It moves into the area of, of theology. Jesus confronts theology. Did you know that? There in verse 13 and following, they sent some people to ask him a question. They asked him a question about a poll tax. Is it lawful to pay a poll tax or not? They're trying to entrap Jesus. Jesus was so wise. Jesus said, well, let me see that coin that you pay the poll tax with. They gave him a denarius, and he says, Who's, in whose image is this made? And they said, it's Caesar's. Then render to Caesar that which is Caesar, but render to God that which is God. You know the truth that he was presenting? Jesus takes the question about a poll tax, switches it all around, and he teaches this. In whose image are you made? You're made in the image of God. Then Render to God that which is made in God's image. And he talks about the need and the desire and the must of our life that we would give our lives to him. All God wants of you is one simple thing. He wants your life. Doesn't want your money. Doesn't want your talent. He wants your life. And if he has your life, he has everything else. Amen? Everybody wants to give Jesus something, give God something. I'm going to give you a part. I'm going to give you a token over here. And Jesus said, no, nah, I don't take tokens. The only thing I'm looking for is a thing that's made in my image, and that's your entire life. You can go deal with God all day long. You know, I'm here to tell you, he doesn't make deals. He knows what he wants. He knows what he has. He knows what he made. He knows what he needs of you. Well, the next question came up about those who didn't believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection, so they tell Jesus the story. They said, there was a family. There were seven brothers. And whenever the first brother married this woman, he died. And then there was leveret marriage. You know what leveret marriage is? That is the brother, the next brother had to marry the, the wife of the older brother in order to have, uh, give a posterity to that, to that brother. So he tells his story. The first brother died, and then the second brother married that woman, and he died, and the third, and the fourth, all the way through seven brothers, they all married the same woman. That's a tough woman. That's a tough woman or a weak bunch of boys, amen? An impossible situation, but the question was, well, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? And Jesus said, that's not the question. <laughs> that's not the question. It's not whose wife will she be. It's the fact that there is and will be a resurrection. Or see, he was dealing with a the theology. So, some said, wait a minute now. We don't really think, there, we don't really think there's this, this resurrection. And Jesus said, I really don't care what you think. This is the truth. <laughs> this is the truth. What amazes me so much is that is all the people who want to debate this Bible. Did you know that? They want to debate this Bible. In our generation, they want to debate this Bible. Now, isn't it amazing to me that people are in our age range from, what, 10 years old here to 90 years old? I don't know how old you are, but that's not very old compared to this Bible. This Bible's existed a lot longer than you've ever thought about existing. It's gone through every test of time, every trial that could possibly be, and it's still true. It's still God's Word. It doesn't contain God's Word. It is God's Word. And people still want to debate it. And that's the most arrogant thing I've ever seen in my life. Whenever somebody comes up and says, Well, I tell you what, I just don't believe all the Bible. whoop de doo who cares? <laughs> that really, really shakes my faith. That you don't believe. That you, you aren't even wet behind the ear, dry behind the ears yet, and you don't believe the Bible. Listen, I'm here to tell you, that's kind of what Jesus says about that issue. We don't like the idea that resurrection, we don't believe it. Jesus said, I really don't care. The issue is there is the resurrection. Did you know that offended folks? Some of you got offended when I just said that. Uh-oh. Sorry. Sorry. The Word of God has a way of offending us at times, doesn't it? Well, he goes on down here. Another one says, what's the greatest commandment? trying to entrap him to find out which is the commandment. Once again, asking about this Bible of the Old Testament. Which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus summarizes it, and he says, Hey, there's two great commandments. One's to love the Lord your God with all that you are, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Wow. He goes on through the process. And he goes all the, way, all the way down here to in verse 41. If there's nothing else going to make him mad, in verse 41 of chapter 12, he deals with giving. 
It's when he's standing there at the treasure watching the widow put in the pennies. And then he makes this statement after the Pharisees have walked by and they've thrown so much money in there. And he says, that woman gave more than anybody else because she gave out of her need instead of out of her plenty. Well, if you want to make anybody mad in, in regard to Christianity or in regard to faith, just talk about money and giving. Man, I can't believe they want people to give it. Jesus confronted that. You know what? It made them mad. People get upset when you talk to them about giving and the need to tithe and the need to give offerings and to give to God that which is God. That can make people so upset. But you know what? That's just the Word of God. That's just Jesus. Jesus is the one who said that. And then in chapter 13, the whole chapter 13 is about end times. Jesus tells what's going to happen at the end of time. I mean, he lays out every detail. And it was not the way they had it planned. They had it planned a whole lot different than that. They wanted it to be easy. But it wasn't going to be easy. It was going to be difficult and hard and going through some very tough times. And what, they didn't like his eschatology. They didn't like his end times theology. And they got offended at that. Well, let me tell you something. I've seen people get offended and they get upset with each other because they've got different charts about how this thing's going to all end. One's got a chart that this is the way it's going to end and this is what's going to happen and somebody else got them a chart over here of what's going to happen and what's going to take place. Let me fill you in on that. None of your charts are right. If Jesus, when he walked here as a man, did not know the end times, and he said that, that's up to the Father to know. He knows it now. But while he walked here, he didn't know the end result and the end plans and all of those things. Do you think you know it? You think that guy with that chart knows it? I've seen people get out of fellowship with each other because they had different eschatology, how it's all going to end. Because they're more concerned about their charts than they are about Jesus. Well, Jesus confronted them about their eschatology, and they got offended. Wow. The whole week, those days, from Sunday to Friday, Jesus confronting them about their lives and giving them an opportunity to change or to be offended. And they get offended. And they come up in chapter 14, and this is what happens in chapter 14. They say, we need to get rid of this guy. <laughs> we need to get rid of this guy. I'm telling you, he's done hurt my feelings. He's made me mad. He talked to me about things I don't like to talk about. He dealt with things I don't want to deal with. We need to get rid of that guy. How did that happen? This is how it happens. Anytime a heart gets offended, listen to me now. You need to write this down. You need to know this. Anytime a heart or a life gets offended, that life and that heart is opened up to the enemy for him to use persuade, influence to make them do things they could never imagine doing. Did you hear what I said? A heart that is offended is opened up to the enemy for his influence and his work to do things unimaginable to those people. That's exactly what happened to them. They were offended. They said, we need to do something with him. And old Satan comes along and says, I'll help. The high priest comes along and says, hey, I'll help. They're all agreeing they will help. And the whole scheme goes out and, and the whole practice begins to happen and they arrest Jesus and scourge him. They do all of those things to Jesus and it comes to a place of saying, what do we do with Jesus? And they say, crucify him, crucify him. The same people who had said, Hosanna to God in the highest are crying, crucify him. Why are they doing that? Because their hearts were offended and it's open to Satan and Satan is causing them to say things they don't even know why they're saying. If you don't believe that, then you need to read Luke's account of the gospel, uh, Luke's account in the gospel about the, the uh, crucifixion and the death of Jesus. And this is what it says in Luke's account. It says, and when Jesus breathed his last, 
the people looked around at what had happened and they went away weeping. Why were they weeping? Because they had done some things, they had said some things, they had acted a way they never thought they could possibly act. Because in their offense, the old enemy moved in. Let me tell you something, that's not just in Bible times. You let your heart get offended, you let Jesus confront you, and you're not willing to respond to Jesus the right way. If somebody else offends you, it opens up your life to old Satan. As a child of God, you're preserved in the hand of God. You don't have to worry, you're preserved in the hand of God. The old enemy cannot get to you, listen, unless you in your heart and your offense and your life, you open up that door to him. And if you open up your life to him, because in that offense you open up your life, oh, Satan will just kind of creep into that door and he'll have opportunity to say, well, why would he do that? Because you've opened up your life. Satan actually has legal standing. He said, well, God, they don't want to do what you're doing. God, they don't like your plan. God, don't like the way you're going. I ought to have an opportunity to have my plan. And oh, Satan can move into your heart and move into your life and cause you to think things, do things, and act ways you never imagined that you could ever act. Why? Because you were offended. And you can be offended at the words of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. And I don't want you to be that way. I don't want you to be Hosanna on Sunday and crucify him on Friday. I don't want that change in your life. I don't want that fall in your life. So how do you keep from being offended? Very important, you need to write three things down. Very quickly, we'll be finished. Three things, you need to write these down. How do I keep from being offended whenever Jesus confronts me? Because he will confront you. He will deal with you in your life. He's promised he'll do that in your life. How do you keep from being offended? Three things. First thing, write this down. Jesus is always right. Jesus is always right. There is no debate. What Jesus says is right. It's holy. It's right. It's always right. You're not right. If you're wrong with Jesus, if you're opposite Jesus, you are not right. Jesus is right. Now, you may be hard-headed about that, and you may beat your head on the concrete for a while, but I'll guarantee you one thing. When you come up with the knots on your head, you're finally and ultimately going to realize Jesus is right. He's always right. So if you're smart, just write that down. Whenever he comes along and tells you something, don't debate whether he's right or not. Don't debate whether he knows it or not. Don't debate any of those things. Just say, okay, Jesus, you're always right. I don't understand it. I can't see it. That's okay. He didn't say you have to. You just say, Jesus, you're always right. Second thing, Jesus always has your best interest at heart. If he comes to you and confronts you and he wants a change in your life, it's for your best. You may not understand it. You may not see it. You may not grab hold of it. You may not see it even until you get to glory. But I promise you, That if Jesus comes and confronts you in your life, it's for your best. It's for your good. Never question that. Oh, Satan will come along and he says, you know, Jesus wants to mess up your life. Satan comes along and says, Jesus wants to take away all your fun. He'll come around and say, Jesus doesn't know the best way. There's other ways. He'll tell you all kind of lies about that. that Every one of those things are lies. Just write it down. Put it in your heart. Jesus has my best interest at heart. Always. Third thing, the acceptable best response when Jesus confronts you is, yes, Lord. Just two words, (laughs) yes, Lord. Not maybe, might be, let's talk about it, just yes, Lord. And if you'll just say yes, Lord, to whatever Jesus confronts you with, you'll be fine. If he comes along and he's confronting you about the area of worship and he says, this needs to happen, this needs to change in your life, yes, Lord. If he's talking about your theology and what you think and what you hold to and what you believe and he confronts you about that area, all you say, yes, Lord. 
If he comes and talks to you about lordship and him having opportunity to be lord of your life and in control of everything and you giving your life totally and absolutely to him, you don't need to discuss it. You ain't got to argue about it. Just say, yes, Lord. And when you say, yes, Lord, you move your life in that direction. You don't get offended and you don't let the enemy have any access to your heart. Just say, yes, Lord. Oh, Brother Mac, that's hard. I know. But remember, he's always right. And he always has your best interest at heart. So whatever he's telling you, the best choice is always, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Three ways. Now, there are a lot of things you may write down and say, well, I don't know if I'll ever need this. You will need this. You will need that this week. This week. Unless you are perfect, lost, or so far away from God you can't hear Him. Because I promise you, this week He's going to be dealing with something in your life. He's going to be working in you. Moving in you. Transforming you. He's always right. Your best interest, yes, Lord. 